All right, so we're ready to start. Hey everyone, my name is Travarsi. Welcome to Modulation Sound Lab. Uh, Modulation Sound Lab is a learning platform on Patreon where we do Zoom sessions, one-on-ones, and we take it as an opportunity to learn from each other. We do a monthly voltage amplifier where we talk about sound design and other uh, influences and inspirational aspects of music. And today uh, I have Chris Myers because we had this brilliant idea of, hey, why not do a Patreon mashup? He's one of my patrons. I'm one of his patrons. <laughs> so we're like, yeah, well, what? we should have done this before. So Chris, you want to talk about learning modular? Yeah. Thanks to everyone who's showed up today. And um, I'm Chris Meyer, and I run the Learning Modular Patreon channel. And it's basically documenting in long form and great detail my journey in modular these days. It started out a few years ago as really deep dives into individual modules. But as I've been evolving to get more into composition and performance, I've been sharing more of those aspects in addition to advanced patch tricks and things like that. And what I like about the Patreon format is I can go deep dive, I can go really long form, and it's there for you all the time. It doesn't scroll off the bottom of your Instagram or your Facebook page. So for those who are already my subscribers, welcome. I hope to do more of these because I want to reach out and talk to people more often and answer more of your questions. And to Modulation Sound Lab members, welcome. And um, hope you enjoyed today's session. All right, so um, I guess I'm going to start with the questions and just kind of get the ball rolling. And like I said, feel free to use a little Mojicon thing and raise your hand so you can interject and jump on. Um, oh, and I just want to say that because um, I know that Chris has covered in Learning Modular just some of the historic things that he's been working on throughout his journey in music, and he's done some recent interviews. I thought because of time, this would be a really cool opportunity to kind of look at what's happening in that's happened, I guess, within the past year and a half or so. Like what, because you've had uh, quite a bit of evolution in between like how you, where you were yeah, then. The pandemic forced me to reevaluate and do a lot of changes. <laughs> yes, yes. So, and talk about what's happening in your studio now. So. I think I'll go far as far back as so you were at my house for SoCal Sin Society. You did a patch and tweak book signing thing here. We had you did a patch, uh, a great patch walkthrough and breakdown, and then you did a jam. And in that case, you had your 12U, and it was mainly focused on percussion, if I remember correctly, and percussive patching techniques and um you jammed with abe and he handled more of the melodic side of the jam right and so what i saw you tore your case apart when i was at your house <laughs> so, <laughs> so like let's like let's start there like let's go let's start there because that's literally i think when the pandemic started yeah even <laughs> that even before yeah. Even before I got back into modular, um, I would go play music with other people. Back in the late 90s, early 2000s, particularly, I would bring Ableton Live or sampling drum machines yeah. and then act as the drummer playing with other people in a completely improvised context. And I had a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. And then when I got back into modular, I wanted to see how far I could push the modular system on its own. I wanted to see where my personal limits were with what I could do with the modular before I started introducing other elements. And it just so happened that during that process, some people I played with back in the 90s and 2000s said, hey, I'm throwing a major birthday party. I want to get the band back together, come out here for this one time jam. So I said, OK, what can I do with modular percussion as opposed to loop based and Ableton Live based percussion? And since I am now living in New Mexico and all my bandmates were back in California, what can I fit into the overhead compartment on an airplane? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what motivated putting together the travel case, which has been nicknamed the TARDIS, um, because there's so much more inside there than people imagine when they open up the lid. And it, it was focused again on how do I be the drummer, improvising, backing other people. And I did it with my folks back in LA, did it with Abe out of your meeting. I did it with other people, Jim Coker at 512 here in Albuquerque and a lot of other situations. Mm. So I was very percussion focused and very much jam focused. Uh, very much collaboration focused for quite some time. And I was completely happy doing that. And before the pandemic, it, I literally had a schedule planned every month. I'm going to go to this town, play with the following people, 
next month going to this town, I'm gonna to go record with these people. And then the pandemic hit and we went into lockdown. And I said, okay, I don't wanna stop doing music, but I can no longer go collaborate and jam with others. What do I do? And that's when I turned to the big system behind me, the monster, and said, okay, it's time for me to face the beast I've been ignoring of how do I compose my own long form solo music? I've done a few solo pieces just because when you're out playing with other situations, they want you to play a set as well. And I've done some kind of tone poem type stuff that I have mixed feelings about. But suddenly I had to like say, okay, can I do a 20 minute piece? that's all me, not just being a drummer and leaving the melodic parts to other people. And what really pressured that is that David Soto, the Colorado Modular Synth Society, invited me to be part of October Skies, one of the first of the space music things. Mm -hmm. And I like to use deadlines to pressure me to do stuff. It's easy to say, oh yeah, I'm gonna learn this someday. I'm gonna do this someday. And someday never happens because you're just doing your daily routine. I started getting into a habit of whenever performance opportunities came up, take them, then worry about how I was gonna pull it off. Because I wanted to force myself to start composing and performing on my own and see if I can make that happen. And that's been heavily my focus since spring of last year. And it's completely transformed the way I think about music, and the way I do things. And um, it's been a lot of fun. So, okay, so going back to the performance for Colorado and thinking about, so now you're introducing the monster case and I know that you had the vector what was the sequencer you used before the vector? I was using the vector sequencer for all the stuff back then, the 512 vector sequencer. Okay. The one, the one new element is, previously I wanted to see if I could do everything on modular, but, but then wait, when I started wait, doing I'm, these- But what was ahead. the sequencer you used before the vector? I'm just curious, like- Oh, um, well, in the <laughs> travel kit, tables and live. I mean, I, oh, you, I, I did okay. loops. I didn't okay. sequence, I did loops. <laughs> gotcha. And okay. when I did the travel case for percussion, I had a variety of different trigger pattern generator modules. I'm looking off into space because the case is right there. So I'm just reminding myself, you know, Pam's new workout, a small version of grids, the Euclidean circles, a marbles, um, some logic modules, some skipper modules, combinations of those were how I created different patterns. And I purposely had a variety of different trigger pattern generators because I wanted to be able to jump between different styles. I didn't want to pick one and be in the style that that module did. Part of the idea of that case was to react to other musicians. And I wanted to have different flavors in that case. So I could go different places and react on the spot with what other people are doing. So that's why there's a few different types of trigger pattern generators in there rather than one. And then in the bottom part of the case, I threw a vector sequencer just so I could also do some melodic stuff. Got it. Okay. And so then now going in back into Ableton, I guess now when you're introducing your hybrid setup, um, are you using, so you're, you're sequencing not only with the vector, but also in Ableton? Um, it's all sequenced from the vector or, or performed. So I kind of introduced things in stages. I started by saying, well, what can I do with a monster? Quite a bit. But I'm kind of like, I'm a fan of old Berlin school, 70s Tangerine Dream, Klaus Schulze, and stuff like that. And a lot of that was like Mellotron type pads. And I wanted to introduce those sounds. So I slowly started introducing some polyphonic instruments to flesh out what the modular was doing. So I was sequencing all the parts on the big monster using the vector sequencer, melodic sequences, bass sequences, Amis is playing back the samples. But then I got a keyboard and a Waldorf Iridium and said, okay, if I want to do pads, or something that vaguely resembles a lead, I can do that now while everything else is being sequenced on the big modular. Okay. As time has gone on, I've been introducing more and more elements. Like back in the 90s, I used to play hand percussion on top of the late the loops I played in Ableton Live. Okay, let's start setting up a mic and bringing my hand percussion out of the closet, but run some of it through the modular. Some of it through rings to resonate it and change its tone some of it through long delay chains that I have to set up inside the modular to mix it with other stuff. And at this point, the computer was still used just to record stuff. It wasn't used for any sound generation. And only the last few months, you know, almost co-assigning with the joining modulation sound lab in your effort to help us figure out hybrid studios, did I start to introduce Ableton Live, not just as a multi-track recorder, but saying, okay, can I use it as a multi-track mixer? Um, 
-hmm. Can I use it to play back some sample libraries, some sounds? I like interesting acoustic sounds in addition to modular sounds. I almost prefer primitive sounds over refined instruments. I would prefer listening to a, a several hundred year old Chinese string instrument than a modern classical guitar just because they're rougher and have more interesting harmonics. Mm. And that's the same thing that attracts me to doing modular work is trying to create more interesting harmonic structures. So lately I've been introducing into live, playing back some sample libraries, but I'm not sequencing them in live. I'm either, again, sequencing them from the vector sequencer from the modular, sending it to live, or I'm playing them live on keyboards. Okay, so you're still, you're, you're not sequencing yet or with Ableton. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I currently still don't sequencing see mainly. two. <laughs> right, yeah, no, no, I'm just, because what's interesting is that, um, well, when, because your sequences are always evolving so you're really you must really be using the the sub modulation in that in that sequencer because one of the challenges that i've you know run into with sequencing is like i have the vector sequencer too and um i also use ableton like as well you know in, in other projects or what have you and i understand like the level of sequencing i know you use contact and I guess it's just like always that challenge of breaking out of the eight bar loop, you know, the, yeah. the or like, you know, like I, hey, I play techno, you know, so obviously a lot of it is loopy, but there are some times where I'd like to, you know, like have these really long, just ever flowing sequences, maybe something in the background, you know, like yeah. undertone or ambient and, you know, so that it's, I'm always like thinking how where do I decide what to offload, you know, to the sequencer or how to integrate either Ableton or an iPad or, or something. So I'm just curious, like, you yeah, know, there's a few different ways that, that I yeah. evolve my sequences on the uh, vector sequencer. Mm -hmm. um, the one that I use most often is it has a whole section called chance operations, mm -hmm. where for every step of a sequence, you can say, you can set a probability that Maybe it'll mute the note. Maybe it'll skip the note. Maybe it will transpose the note. Maybe it'll change the velocity duration of that note. So quite a bit of the evolution I do is programming chance operations for my sequence and then actively changing the chance probability during the song. So I may start off with just playing a steady four note sequence, but then start to increase the chance probability or might start muting notes, might start transposing notes, things like that. And I can either do that from a control on the front panel of the vector, or I can also externally CV it. So I might put it on a knob on something else on the machine. I can just reach up and turn a dial without having to do any menu diving on the vector and then change the probability. And I'll do that quite a bit for muting notes in particular. I'll start with, a, say, a 16 note sequence. Hmm. And so the probability of muting might be 95%. So only the occasional note will get through through an echo channel as jazz. And then as the piece builds up energy, then I'll start decreasing the probability notes will be muted and more notes of the sequence will start getting filled in. So it's like having a blank grid and starting to fill in the holes of that grid with notes. So that's one of the main ways that I get constant evolution from the sequences. Um, another way is just good old fashioned multiple sequences and then switching between them. I'll create several variations on a sequence and then switch them from the front panel of the vector. Or also you can use a little Novation launch pad to just go through individual um, patterns for each part in the sequence or set up scenes where all the parts change at the same time. I'll quite often structure songs to go through different scenes where up to 16 scenes for me in a song. Mm. Um, and then I'll plot the evolution of like, I'm gonna start with like a one note, every two measure bass, that's gonna get more active, that's gonna add more notes. And those will just be scenes I step through. Okay, melodic part steps in. That's another scene I switched to. And it's only recently that I started using sub sequences. For those who don't have a vector sequencer, in addition to the normal sequence, it has this thing called a sub sequence that runs underneath it. It's right. mainly modulating the main sequence. It can run at a different speed than the main sequence. It can transpose the entire sequence or do other things to the whole sequence. So you can set up something on a sub sequence to say, keep playing my normal sequence, but after four bars, transpose it up a fifth, after two bars, transpose it down an octave, and it'll do that automatically for you. And I've only started using that just to add more variations on lines. Um, a common trick I'll use 
So I'll set two parts with basically the same sequence running. But then on another scene, I'll start the subsequence on the second part where it'll start transposing and creating intervals and harmonies to the second line that's playing alongside. So I'll start with these two parts playing basically in unison, but on different patches. Mm -hmm. Then later on say, okay, now you start playing a fifth above the other one, then an octave below the other one, just automatically step through the subsequence and bring on those variations, just again to add more complexity. And then uh, the for, other area, go ahead. Sorry, I, before you, I just wanna go back to the probability really quick yeah. before you kind yeah. of transition over, cause Scott had a question. So can you change yeah, yeah. the probability for all chance operations at once, or are you just changing probability for a specific chance operating at a time, i.e. mute? Yes. Um, the way that the vector sequencer is laid out is it has a dedicated rotary encoder for each of eight steps of a sequence. Mm -hmm. and you can page through multiple pages. And then it has what's called the ninth encoder, which changes all the parts at the same time. So sometimes mm -hmm. I'll use the ninth encoder to change it for all of the notes in the sequence. And other times I will just go ahead and, and dial in individual steps. The other tricky little thing that the vector has, which I'll take advantage of is um, selection sets. I can say, okay, I always want the first note of the sequence to play. So I'm gonna leave that out of the selection. I always gonna play the first note of the sequence, but I'm gonna select steps two through eight. And now encoder nine will change the probability of those remaining steps. So I'll always have the downbeat hitting, but then use one encoder to go ahead and make the other notes appear or disappear while still keeping the downbeat steady because it's outside of the selection and not being affected by the probability. Gotcha. So, Okay, so then with everything you just said, and believe me, like I use the vector sequencer and I love it. So, but one of the things like, how do you focus on the challenge or is this something that just doesn't bother you? I think we talked about this the other day and my thing is like, I play the piano and you know, sometimes I just, you know, it's like extremes for me. It's either techno and it's like super loopy or like sometimes I just wanna have the ability to just sit down and play and that be my sequence you know what i mean and not think about yeah. is it in eight bars maybe it's 16 bars maybe it's 32 maybe there's some dotted quarter notes or some triplets or eights or what have you you know and like when you're talking about sequencing this on the vector and i we talked about this like it's yeah. are you now more focusing like when you're using your monster rack or do you are you now more focusing on the mathematical way to sequence or do you feel like are there other ways for you to use your modular or are you using something else in your case to get away from that yeah. feeling or there's do you not, feel that way i guess is like that's not, like the other there, there's like, there's not there's not one answer there's multiple answers <laughs> to that question um so sequences usually i'll start by just playing on the keyboard and working out just melodies or bass lines that sound good to me. And then I'll transcribe them into what's the note duration, what's the note value into a sequence. So I'll, I'll do, do that sometimes. Them in Ableton or do you transcribe them? Like I just go straight to the notes? vector and say, you know, I'll, I'll write down on a piece of paper, okay, obviously I'm holding this for three beats. Then this note, you know, eighth, eighth, sixteenth hold. I'll yeah. actually transcribe out what I was playing on the keyboard, and then enter that into the vector, which is a laborious process. One disadvantage of the vector is it's not a real-time sequencer. I think maybe Eloquencer can perhaps do that where you can play live into it, the vector cannot. Okay. Um, but I'll just go ahead and do some simple bass lines where I'll transcribe it. But the other ways, I honestly, I, I'm not as formal of a composer where I write a score and the score has to be executed exactly. I take much more of a, a granular synthesis approach to the notes being played by the instrument, where I really think in terms of note density and stuff like that. Just like I think of how dense are my grains when I'm playing back granular synthesis, I, I think more in terms of here are my notes, here's how dense I want to play the notes. Do I want lots of rest? Do I want short timing, long timing in between the notes, stuff like that. So I work far more on building systems that will allow me to change the density of the notes that I have chosen. So I separate the notes that I've chosen from the timing that those notes are played. And that's kind of a, a major way that I think about music that's probably different than a lot of other people is I don't think of, here is my eight note phrase that must be played over these two bars. I think of, 
here's the notes that are going to be in here. Here's the harmonic structure or the chord or whatever that's going to be the vibe for this piece of music. Separate from that, now let's work on how those notes are played. How do they come out? What's the timing of them? How dense or how sparse are they? And that's where I use things like chance operations. But I also quite often externally clock parts on the sequencer. The vector allows you to bring in external triggers and use those to step along each of its individual eight parts independent from each other. So something I do quite often is I'll either use drum pattern generators, particularly grids, because I really like how it works, or I'll even use drum loops through an envelope follower to derive triggers from when drum events are happening and have those then step through my previously chosen notes on the vector. Mm. And then I can decide what's the general pattern, what's the density of that pattern, either by changing the settings and grids or changing what loop I'm playing to drive the whole system. Got it, okay. I know we've talked, I've tried a little bit of that and it has kind of opened up my eyes to some other approaches to see, to for using clocks for that reason, like with yeah. triggering uh, the vector. Um, and I know you mentioned uh, that you don't, you you steer away from more tradi you, traditional style instruments. You like more, um, I know you've used contact, for example. So it has like the various world drums and percussive, other percussive elements. Uh, when you're looking at, uh, like when you're, choosing oscillators like how do you what what do you gravitate towards like what are you what are you what's your favorite oscillator do you have one and then if so like <laughs> i know that's such a tough question a... but i'm asking you anyway my, and then <laughs> my favorite oscillator is always a mixture of oscillators to be completely honest <laughs> um and then like what's your I, when, when i make a baseline for example it, i know i'm always going to use at least two oscillators and one of them's going to be analog and one of them's going to be digital. And that's just my mindset of I want a range of tones and harmonics. And I'll actively mix during the course of a song which waves I'm using from those two oscillators to change how the bass line sounds throughout the piece. So I'll pick like one analog oscillator. Um, Livewire AFG is my go-to most of the time. But I also use um, Bird Kids, The Bad Lure. Um, WMD, SSF, Spectrum, and I can go over and show people some of the modules and the system if they want to see it. Those are kind of like my go-tos on the analog side, particularly the AFG, the audio frequency generator from Livewire, has this thing called animated pulses, where instead of just being a square wave and pulse wave modulation, it does a pulse that's positive and a pulse that's negative, and you can animate the edges of those independent from each other. Cool. So I love that to create a really rich, coarse, square wave type of bass sound. That's one of the core cornerstone to my sound and I may start out with that but then I'm going to layer on top of that a digital oscillator as well such as a dove, a dove wave plane maybe a Synthec E352 I love the Waldorf NW1 because it has so many modulation inputs mm -hmm. just to add that more metallic or hollow or you know I think of analog modules as almost being acoustic instruments and to create a non-acoustic timbre then I'll bring in a digital oscillator and then mix that in during a piece just to change the flavor of it during the course of the piece. Um, so I almost always mix together multiple oscillators because I want a mixture of harmonics and be able to change that harmonics mixture during a song. And a lot of what I'm doing when I'm playing is bringing individual waveforms oscillators in and out to thin out a sound or change the character of a sound while I'm playing. Yeah. Uh, and as for other sounds, I seem to gravitate towards plucked and bell sounds quite a bit. So. And I will patch that up sometimes. And sometimes I just, you know, I have rings and things like that in the case as well. Cool. Uh, Nick had a question. He's wondering if you had a chance to use the nerd sec. And if you, and if you I can. have not. Um, I looked at it, looked at the manual of it, and <laughs> it's, it looks like it's extremely powerful. But part of the reason that I made the gravitation away from doing very computer based stuff to doing modular based stuff. Is I kind of wanted to get away from the screen and menu diving. And the nerd, I've not used the nerd seek, so this may be a completely inaccurate interpretation of it. It looked like I would be having to go through a lot of menus to get what I want out of that thing, as opposed to the vector, which had so much UI right up on the surface, which I kind of personally preferred. The other completely um, physical object is that my eyes are not great. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm legally blind in some states without correction. Now, I, have, I do wear correction when <laughs> I can see, but tiny displays and me do not mix. <laughs> so anything that has a small display is less likely to be used in my system. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm with you on that. <laughs> That's the eyewear. Um, I think Brian asked what you what the first oscillator you mentioned, but I believe uh, it was the live wire AFG. Was that? Yeah, live wire Laura, AFG. You dropped it is, in there um, for us. Awesome. Um, yeah. Oh, Todd had to. Yeah, <laughs> I think I'm. Yeah, we'll see him again message. later. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, does anybody? I can go over have to the any... system and actually scan. I can scan along the oscillator rows if you're curious to see what's in the current in the case right now. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. And then while um, you're kind of getting situated with that, does anybody have any questions? I mean, I know you people have been dropping some things in the chat, but, you know, feel free to raise your hand and, and you know, jump in and. So I've kind of divided my system into different types of oscillators. And uh, most Chris, of them are on gonna, the left side. Oh, here. Give me a moment. I'm going to pin you. And so we go, uh, let me pin you. So, okay. All right. Okay. Go ahead. So I have a couple of different oscillators where I get to play with additive synthesis. I've been using the verbose harmonic oscillator for quite a while now. And the trick with the verbose harmonic oscillator, the one on the right there is you have to modulate it. If you just set up the sliders to a particular tone, it's going to sound like an organ, but I like to either modulate the blend, the uh, scanning of the individual harmonics or do things like apply um, velocity to like maybe the fifth harmonic just to add a little bit of spice on things. And then on the left, I've recently added the Chaos um, Odessa, which is a very powerful mm -hmm. additive synthesis machine. And I've just started using that. I used it for bell tones on the most recent piece I did, Shipwrecked. That's one of my, favorites. Of my favorite. <laughs> yeah. Here's my row of my favorite analog oscillators the uh, audio frequency generator from Livewire, the Spectrum from SSW and WMD. And then the Battalure from Bird Kids. And what I like about the Battalure is that it has a filter built into it that follows its sub octave generator. So, right into it, I can have a resonant low pass filter to shape the sound of the wave coming out of it and also modulate it using velocity, um, random signal from a sample and hold so that every note's different as I play it, et cetera. So, that's kind of like the core of my analog row there. Um, Chris, uh, Chris yeah. Ed has a question. Go ahead, Ed. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Um, no, it was just a just a comment about uh, yeah, your videos have been super helpful, and 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 you know the deep dives on the modules are helpful. Uh, but I like I feel like I learn uh, patching from you, and I really appreciate somehow you're able to cover the gear, um, and I'll have ten ideas about how to use my own gear. Somehow it doesn't mm -hmm. turn into I need a thing that does the thing. And so your comment <laughs> about combining oscillators, um, you know, I've, I've, you know, you've, I've heard you say that multiple ways, and it, it's had a big impact on me. In that, you know, so I have five oscillators and uh, four filters, and it turned out that I have infinite sounds from those. And so, so I just wanted to, you know, uh, it's not a question so much as, you know, thank you for that insight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm very much into the, like I don't want combinations, you know. Yeah, I know a lot of people like particularly fall in love with say the noise engineering oscillators because they have a particular sound, although they're versatile, you know, within that, mm -hmm. and that's perfectly cool. You know, it's like picking an instrument and saying this is the instrument I'm going to play. Um, my whole thing for modular is I want to create a different instrument every time I play it, so that's why I'm very much into having combinations of modules. Like I can go ahead and mix and match and bring in and out as I want to. That's kind of my own philosophy. Nothing against saying, hey, I really like, you know, the BIA from noise engineering. I'm going to really use that all the time for my leads because that's your chosen instrument. Um, my chosen instrument is um, harmonics, <laughs> I guess you could say. <laughs> I keep trying to come up with different mixtures of them each time. Indeed, the, your, insight, your yeah. insight caused me to make voices first. And I, I had been doing modular for a year before I, I heard that. And I started actually yeah. making voices first before sequences, and it was a revelation. Yeah, yeah. I have in my head like what type of sound I want to do for each part. So I have the analog row and the additive row. 
I have what I call my modulation row with a Brenso, which is a really nice complex oscillator from Prap Tools. Um, I have the zero point oscillator from SSF. I have to get into that more. I've not mastered that yet. And people are talking about the Dofer. I like the Dofer A110 um, quadrature um, through zero FM oscillator as well. And I'll play around a little bit with the um, mob of emus from Rossum. I was a beta tester on that and had them add a lot of things to that module, like metallic series or harmonics, things like that. But I've not really had time to play with that yet, but I need to get into that. Then below the modulated stuff, I have the various plucked and sound modeling ones. I have rings, pluck, surface. I used to have the audio damage proton as well. I took that out recently because I just, it didn't jive with me personally. But when I want a quick plucked sound, I've got a few of them right there in the system. And then I have my digital row, which is the Waldorf NW1. Gets ignored quite a bit because it takes up so much panel space, but it has so many modulation inputs where you really change its tone, its brilliance, its harmonic mix, the, which wavetable it's using. It can automatically scan the wavetables for you. I use that quite a bit. Piston Honda 3 for grungier stuff. If it stuff sounds more like Prophet VS. Um, Synthetech E352, I use the cloud mode in that quite a bit when I want to create nice hazy clouds of digital sounds. And I really love the Dove Waveplane oscillator because it's very much like a vector synthesis Prophet VS type of oscillator in terms of having four corners, a different waveform in each corner, the ability to modulate in between those. I'll quite often envelope, say left or right, just to go ahead and get a pluck sound. And then I'll go ahead and use a random modulation up and down just to change the tone over the course of a sequence, et cetera. That's my main modulation row in this. So those are my oscillators inside this system in addition to sample players. I'll put that down for now. Travarsi, I think you are muted. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to ask, <laughs> so I wanted to ask, um, about the ways that you're patching when you say layering but i also want to interject and just say again thank you all for being here this is awesome i'm glad we're taking the opportunity to do this uh, for modulation sound lab and learning modular and thank you to those in listening out there in blast radio <laughs> um so my question for you is yeah how are i noticed you had a beast chalkboard and I, I have that module too. I like it. It's like a quick, you know, octaves up, octaves down. What are some of the, when you say you're layering, like how are you patching? Like when you're layering these oscillators? Yeah, I see Brian also asked, you know, how do I go about mixing the oscillators? Oh, perfect. Um, We're on the same page, Brian. <laughs> yeah. In the very middle of the system is a um, low gain submix, which can be, be broken into several different sub mixers. And that's like my central system that I bring all the oscillators into, set up my mixes. I can do a mix of typically three waveforms and have four rows of those, four different mixes of three waveforms. You can also mix together those banks of rows. So almost all the time the oscillators come into the sub mix. And that's where I'm centrally controlling the mixture of the different waveforms. Then they go off to the filters. And in terms of also mixing, I'm very much into playing around with what are different intervals in between the oscillators and changing them quickly. Some oscillators have octave switches built in, a lot of them don't. And I'm not into wild tuning, particularly while in the middle of a jam. So I have in front of all of my sound sources, either an ALM Beast chalkboard or a Clavis Caltrans. The Beast chalkboard has a nice analog switch to go ahead and go up or down by two octaves. So I can do quick octave transpositions. And sometimes I will use that as a performance element during a song. It's just go ahead and suddenly throw a piece up an octave or down an octave just to change the mixes. Just timing my manual changes on downbeats, et cetera. I'll do that with string sounds, et cetera. And then uh, the Clavis Caltrans has two different digital encoders, one to change by semitones and one to change by octaves. And quite often when I'm building a patch, you know, like if I'm building a bass patch, I mentioned I quite often have an analog oscillator, digital oscillator, and quite often I have a third oscillator which is a sine wave or a triangle wave that I will then play around with. Does this work well tuned in unison with them? Is it better as a sub octave? Is it better up two octaves? Sometimes I like to have a triangle wave two octaves above the bass part and be able to mix that in and out as a high element. 
And what the clavis caltrans allows me to do is very quickly change those octave settings or go ahead and tune the semitones to a fifth or whatever. And when I'm building patches, this just allows me to go, what should the relationship between all these sound sources be in terms of relative tuning? Mm -hmm. And be able to do it, just go click, 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 rather than like, and try to get everything to tune that way. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll have a transpose module, Beast Chalkboard or Caltrans in front of every single sound source just to make developing multi oscillator voices faster, but also as a performance tool. Nice. Okay. Okay. I have the Beast Chalkboard. I, I find it to be extremely handy. I'm going to check out this Caltrans because I like that this gives you the option for semitones because the Beast Chalkboard is just octave. That's it. Yeah. Up, ups, octave down. I think you can go up two, down one or something off the top of my head. Yeah. But the main thing about the Caltrans, it was supposed to be a, an oscillator calibrator to go ahead and level out the um, intonation of different oscillators. And it's honestly so so at that some oscillators it does a great job some some oscillators it just doesn't help at all but i'll just put it into um bypass mode for the tuning for the oscillator correction and so just use it as transpose because um for, and that's this is just for the so caltrans. great for okay. the caltrans yeah okay. uh nick yes, uh, said asked if you've ever tried the t43 for transposing i'm not familiar with the t43 what is that one well, let's see. I do have the uh, analog solutions one, and I've looked at the um, Trans Europa. I haven't got one yet, but I'm curious about that. But I don't know what the T forty three is. Uh, it's made by to, the, I'm, the I'm, company that makes the Euclidean circles. Nick, do you have? Oh, it? really? I'm not sure if you're in a place where you can chat. Oh, MKB is one who said he, MKB is one who some of the T43. If he wants to unmute himself, he can talk. Oh, that. sorry, my uh, sorry, MKB. And uh, yes, uh, sorry, Nick. <laughs> Nick's got one too. Uh, yeah, it's 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 really nice. It's just it's 4HP and just has a bunch of, of switches on it for varying numbers of, of of semitones and octaves. So you by combinations of the switch, you can adjust by whatever interval you want. Um, it, it works great. It's not externally modulatable, which is which is too bad, but it's it's still pretty handy. Hmm. Yeah, that's nice to know. I, I, now that you mentioned, I've seen pictures of it, but I just assumed it was like the doper that only did octave. I didn't realize it, it had different semitones as well. That's great. Cool. Yes, um, Chris. Um, yeah, I double up almost everything. I need to make a mic adjustment. Um, so while you're kind of talking a little bit about uh, the patching techniques, I'm going to just fix my mic really quick. OK, no problem. <laughs> it's been sounding OK, but that's fine. All right. Just if you're wondering what I'm doing. All right. Yeah, I kind of grew up um, really liking detuning. So I'll use at least two sound sources for almost everything, even if it's just a matter of adding a sine wave or a triangle wave to a pluck module or a rings module, just so I can go ahead and say, beef up the fundamental or add an additional higher harmonic and then add some additional coursing to the sound as well. Um, I just kind of grew up in that school where, you know, most since when I was learning since had two or three VCOs, the Prof of Yes had four VCOs for a voice. Um, I did work in sequential for a while when you're doing a one DC over voice instrument. And internally, we consider that to be our dark days when you couldn't have a second oscillator to go ahead and detune it. But that's another reason I have so many sound sources in there is I want to go ahead and go ahead and bring in another sound source, um, either for a different tonal character, but sometimes just as another harmonic, just to be a, a subtle subharmonic or to make the fundamental that much stronger or just add a high airy element too. Because I really like you know, whatever what the uh, mix engineer is called air. I really like the stuff that happens from 5K on up frequency wise, and just have some floating harmonics happening up there as well. Do we have a mic controversy yet? I think so. Do Go you ahead, Anthony. Okay, right now? Yeah, sorry, my question's hard, hard to type. Um, speaking yeah. <laughs> of detail, one of the things that surprised me with modular is how hard some oscillators are to tune or to keep in tune. So are there, techniques you found that make that easier or particular oscillators that are especially manageable? Yeah, I mean, some are frankly crap. <laughs> some cheap ones will only track two or three octaves and that's it. Um, 
one of the things I like about the AFG is that it does track such a wide range of octaves, for example. The spectrum's pretty good too. There's a couple different tricks I use to extend the useful range of an oscillator. One is I found it really important to stabilize the temperature inside my case. When my case was completely closed up, I found it just kept getting hotter and hotter and hotter over time. And as the case got hotter, the analog oscillators would drift along with the temperature inside the case. So having mm -hmm. something like just vent holes in the bottom and top, so there was ventilation and the temperature would stabilize, or even adding fans to the system, so they would reach a temperature and get stable, would make the oscillators more stable. So they wouldn't drift over time. The second thing is some things just don't track very well for more than one or two octaves. And my favorite tool for that is AJH makes a module called the V-Scale, which gives you a 10 turn trimmer to go ahead and adjust that tracking or intonation of each oscillator. So when I have one that's like going sharp on the bass notes and going flat on the high notes, I'll go through the AGH V scale and I have an AGH V scale for every one of my sound sources, just to show you how crazy I am. And part of setting up the system is tweaking out the V scale to try to get four or more in tune octaves out of each sound source. And some of them just need to be leveled out. Now, some I'm of gonna modules... drop the link in the chat. Can you guys hear me okay right now? I just wanna make sure. Yeah. Okay, Corey. All right, for those on Blast Radio, I think they, I think they should be able to hear me now. So thank you all for tuning in, and I dropped the links also to some of the modules yeah. that you're talking about. Yeah, and I use yeah. the V scale and everything. Now some modules have trimmers on the front panel, and and if I can trim a module on the front panel, I will do that just to make my life easier. But some of the modules have the trim controls on the back panel. So I've actually had problems with some modules with just the mere act of taking it out of the case changes the temperature around the module and it changes its tuning. So mm. to cure those, I have an AGHV scale channel in front of every one of my sound sources. And when I do a major reorg of the case, I will spend a day going through all of the oscillators and trying to get them all to level out and track at least four octaves. And that's once you've got that nailed, it's really great when you go patching because you can just pick any sound source and they're going to work together. Instead of like, oh yeah, this one's going out of tune with this one. I have to go retune this one. So it's worth putting in the day up front to tune everyone and work on the tracking for everyone just so it doesn't become an issue when you're trying to actually make music. So Chris, not to throw you off completely, but now that you've you know been patching on the monster, <laughs> uh, you know, through, uh, you know, being, um, Patron of, of Modulation Sound Lab. We've talked a lot about hybrid setups, performing live, and I know your you know your situations changed a bit you know <laughs> with the leg scenario, but I know that's in the front of your mind of thinking about you know getting back out there and making music during this time that you're home, but then getting to a place where yeah. you can travel and perform again. Are you going to? bring it back into incorporating Ableton and after you're using the mo the monster are you going to sample that and play back audio or have you thought about all of this yeah I've been thinking about it and I don't have an answer yet part of it is I have to make a decision am I going to say hey when I go on the road I'm just going to do percussion and do it to back other people and that's just my in-person persona or do I want to create these richer, fully orchestrated solo pieces when I'm outside of my studio? Mm. I have to make that decision first. And I'm, I'm leaning towards the latter. And then I'm looking at what do I need to add to the percussion case to satisfy me in terms of adding those additional elements I've been relying on in the rest of the studio. And I have a few ways to go and I've not chosen a path yet. Um, some of the paths that have been brought up are, I could just, you know, Ableton Live, load a contact, bring a key step. Um, vector sequencer can go ahead and sequence parts inside Ableton Live. I can play them from the key step. That will help me flesh out a lot of my pieces by doing the chordal pad stuff or playing some of the additional sample percussion that I'm relying on inside contact. So that's one solution is just go back to bringing the laptop in addition to the percussion case, using a live to, to expand things out. I do have an Ableton push. I'm pretty happy with using that. That might be a front end solution. Two other ways 
that I've been thinking about going is rather than saying, recreate what I do in my studio, instead say, let's use this as an opportunity to make a different type of music. So when I go out live, it's a different thing than being inside the studio with all of the resources. Gotcha. And lately, particularly the piece I've um, put out most recently, uh, Shipwrecked, it's kind of pointing towards that direction of doing much more floating music and something that's much more, I don't know what's the right term, apprehensive feeling than necessarily sequenced and driving type of music. And what would I need to add to my current gigging case to make that happen? One person has said, hey, you know, you've got stems for all the stuff you've recorded. Just load that into a looper, like a Roland looper, the one with all the individual knobs, the, the mobile loop tracks. Mm -hmm. Just go ahead and live perform the loops which appeals to me because that's how I used to play ages ago. Um, the other thing is I'm really, really happy with this little blue box, the vector sequencer out of the Czech Republic, the vector synthesizer out of the Czech Republic. Um, it does really cool sequence arpeggiated pluck sounds. It does really cool sustained mass of harmonics type of sounds. And I'm leaning towards what can I do with that, in addition to the gig in case, it would be a, a minimum footprint way of expanding what I'm doing. It's just to bring along this little blue box and the, the website is vectorsynth.com. Um, so I haven't decided what I'm going to do when I start going back out again. And um, what's really kind of funny is, you know, after having COVID knock out my last tour plans, back a couple months ago, I had plans like, oh, I'm gonna go here in August, I'm gonna go here in September, I'm gonna go here in October, and then I broke my leg. I can't get out of, the, out of the house for a while. So it's allowed me to procrastinate and put off that decision of what I'm going to do when I finally get back out of the house. But I think I do want to do fuller ambient with a rhythmic element pieces when I get out and start playing live in front of other people. I think that'd be the best solution, but I'll still have the, um, I'm staring off to space because I'm looking at the TARDIS, my gigging case, and like, yeah, what are you and I going to do? What's our future together? Um, <laughs> Having that case so I could go ahead and still jam with other people, which is something I dearly love. That's my that's my happy space. Composing a piece of music hard. Um, jamming and doing percussion for other people, that's really easy for me. Right. Um, but then also wanting to say, what are the minimum number of elements I need to add to that system to also do melodic solo stuff that I'd be happy with? Have you thought about then integrate, like just maybe taking doing some of the melodic elements with maybe an oscillator integrating Ableton and then maybe having more of a, still keeping your percussive elements in modular since you're, you know, since you have a love for percussion and then, or maybe even incorporating contact since you like contact and sequencing that with the modular, like how you, how you have been doing in the studio. Yeah, it would be easy for me. It it would be easy to add a laptop to the system, take a few tracks out of the vector sequencer over MIDI, USB, plug it into the laptop and say, okay, to broaden my sonic palette, I'm gonna have the vector sequencer sequence stuff on the laptop, live manipulate the percussion stuff in the TARDIS, then bring along some keyboard controller, be it a key step, maybe a instrument, something like that, to mm -hmm. then play pads on top, out of live. Able, able to live. That would probably satisfy everything I want to do. Um, I know a lot of people have been saying just, you know, and this has been your advice to me and it's good advice, but I can't get myself there yet. I like <laughs> pick the part you want to perform and make everything else automatic. And I can't get my head to do that yet because currently all my performances are pretty much like I'm flying a whole cockpit. Right. The plane. Hey, I understand. And I mean, I, I give that advice, but it's hard for me to follow sometimes. <laughs> so right now, I'm still like, even if there's previously sequenced lines or loops or ambiences or whatever, I'm so used to being able to change the flight path of every single one of those parts while I'm playing. And this idea of, oh, no, just make that a track in Ableton, let it go linear while you change the percussion on top of it would certainly be easy, but I can't mentally get there yet. And right. that's why... I'm, I'm looking at something like the uh, Roland um, loop board that has like five different loop channels that you can go ahead and half speed, double speed, change the sync of and things like that in real time. So I can at least live manipulate all those other so-called linear tracks. Mm -hmm. Very so cool. 
not I just want to check in with yet. everybody. Still in process. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to take a moment and check in. My apologies, everyone out there, and for Blast Radio. I think you should be able to hear me now. So this is Travarsi, and this is a Patron mashup of Modulation Sound Lab and Learning Modular. And Chris is one of my patrons, and I am one of his. And we thought it would be a great way to integrate and have our patrons meet hang out and i thought it would be kind of cool to stream it here so those listening on blast could hear some of the things that we do in in on our patreon groups um and so yeah chris we're, we're talking to chris myers right now about his journey over the past year and a half and changes with his modular case his setup hybrid not hybrid <laughs> i know right and just like the whole process, I guess, you know, it's just, it's always changing for me too. Like that's, it is easy for me to say, pick one thing and then like, you know, like that to, and then, you know, you can't do it all. And I have to remind myself that every single day, especially when I'm preparing for this show that's coming up, you know, so it's, in, it's good to hear some of your, your approaches to like, yeah, uh, it's interesting. Like, there's been suggestions like, why don't I you know, just write a custom sequence for Max um, MSP? Right now, I'm very happy with all the things that the vector gives me, and also my various percussion stuff. Um, mm. It's more of a control surface issue, and the control surface that I've integrated in my system lately that's been making life much easier is I have a Novation 49 SL Mark III keyboard, and what I like about it is it has lots of displays, lots of sliders, and it can actually act as my mixer interface for Ableton Live while still do, being a keyboard with MIDI five pinned in outs, two different ones, USB outs, two different ones, um, well, two different channels and one USB and two different CV gate outputs. And what I've learned is that I can just go ahead and change different settings, sessions on the Novation and say, now it's going to play the module, change session. Now it's playing a virtual instrument inside Ableton Live, change session. Now it's going out over MIDI to play my Iridium. And that has been a big boon for me to be able to stay focused. I just can put the Novation in front of the modular. I've got my mix surface right here. I've got my keyboard here. The keyboard is playing the computer, the polysense over there, or the modular, depending on how I'm changing the sessions on the Novation. And there's a few videos of me like walking around the studio from one side of the studio to another to play different parts of it. Right. Um, I've become much happier just having everything here in my peripheral vision and within reach rather than having to walk around the studio to do so. Nice. So now with adding all the, the we've talked about the different hybrid setups and the, incorporating with modular. Have you used VCV rack in the same way? Have you thought about it? I have it not have used you? VCV rack yet. I have not used VCV rack yet. Um, nothing against it. It seems to be really awesome. Um, part of it is, I like to joke, you know, um, when I was a puppy, I was kicked and therefore I am fearful. Um, I used some of the really earliest virtual instruments back before they had figured them out. Um, and it was too easy to make them overdrive or do bad, nasty things. That mm -hmm. I got burned at an early point in the development of virtual instruments. So I'm kind of reluctant to go to them. Um, I also like multi-touch. I joke with people that the modular is the multi ultimate multi-touch interface. Mm -hmm. That all said, man, VCV rack is really, really attractive because I could just, instead of being so worried about what can I fit into the overhead compartment of an airplane, mm -hmm. I can just focus on what modules I want to live manipulate the controls on and then run everything else virtually in VCV rack to expand the system. And mm. that's an attractive alternative to traveling lighter is instead of saying my entire universe is inside this 12U case and this is all my universe may contain, it's just say, no, the, the case contains the stuff I want to manipulate in real time with its hardware interface and then put all the other parts you know, all the other modules necessary to flesh out those voices in the VC, VCV rack. Um, that's really attractive way of working. I just haven't gone that way yet. 
especially with like the use of like an ES8 or ES9. There are a couple of people that are messaging right now in the chat. Uh, Nick, love VCV. It's incredible. Um, and then, but Christian Mueller, he, uh, feedback <laughs> though and CPU use. So have, I'm just curious, I just want to ask them, have you had issues with CPU um, overload using VCV rec? Uh, Mueller? Sorry, I, I stupidly no 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 I stupidly <laughs> started typing which makes no sense obviously because they can just answer uh, by voice uh, no I mean yeah exactly all the time like the CPU use is is crazy especially if you build any bigger patch and uh, I don't know I turn to turning down the uh, refresh rate of the interface which which helps quite a lot because I feel like the interface is using a the processing power, but then you have a problem with like not up. Um, so it's also not ideal. Um, yeah, I, I feel you need a beefy computer. So I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's to be truly tested before life set, I guess, if that if that works stable. Got you. Yeah, and then you have the that. feedbacks problems. That's the other thing. Like feedback path are just different in analog than than simulated, and you get to that pretty easily if you just do a manual delay feedback path or something. Got it. That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I've been holding off on is um really waiting for the new Apple M1 Plus laptops. I really want to get a 16 inch. Mac Pro with a brand new M1 chips in it, because that seems to be such a breakthrough in horsepower. Uh, I think that's going to make running more stuff virtually a lot more viable in, in a hybrid, in a portable hybrid system. Yeah, I agree. I've always been. Um, I mean, I play with VCV rack, but it's like, I it's very separate than from what I'm doing over there in that messy table behind me. <laughs> you know, it's like almost like this therapeutic thing, like I'll open it and and I can do it on my desktop because I have a very powerful desktop. But when I think about like when you and I were talking about hybrid setups, what we can take on the road, I am I am a little bit leery about it. I I've used the iPad for some things too, like sequencing things like that, but the V but VCV rack it seems it seems cool, but I just I would hate for it to crash in the middle of like a a long warehouse set or something. <laughs> but yeah. But ha ha haven't you ever had a module freeze on you? I've had modules freeze on me during while playing. Yeah. Rare, rarely, I don't want to jinx myself, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where you just had to power down and power it back on yeah oh that's that's absolutely painful when you have to repower the system um something that, that just falls out naturally i have um, a clamshell case six you in the top six you in the bottom they each have separate power supplies and occasionally i've gotten lucky going okay it's the top it's for example monsoon in the top half that's frozen I can just reboot the top half of the case and not reboot the sequencer and this mixer in the bottom half of the case. <laughs> but that's rare you get away with stuff like that. <laughs> but it's interesting. I want to see how far I can push it because I'm I'm I like physical interfaces. I I used to do live sound. I'm I'm very comfortable sitting behind a large board in the dark, manipulating a lot of controls. That's mm. that's how I grew up in my involvement with music. Um, but I'm trying to get more comfortable with soft interfaces. I don't like one fader page, one fader page, one fader, but I'm okay with a glass interface with multiple faders up there at the same time. Hmm. So we just had a really good modulation sound lab yesterday and integrating the iPad. And it's got me thinking about, can I offload some of my UI and mixing to the iPad to free up more space in the cases or add some more capability inside there? There's a, a huge amount of the real estate in my gigging case is a WMD performance mixer with expander. And if I can offload that to an iPad, that's very interesting. Because mm -hmm. someone said, if you're worried about crashing, don't go the iPad route. 
Computers are my friends. They wouldn't do that to me. Nick, what was, if you don't mind, like, what, what was your, why do you make that statement? Are you in I a mean, place? Yeah, I, I've, I've been playing with some of that stuff for a while. Actually, before I got into modular, I was doing a lot of the, like, messing around with the iPad stuff. But um, AUM in particular is, like, super powerful. But for whatever reason, uh, especially if you're trying to connect it to, like, an external audio interface, uh, if for whatever reason it, like, loses connection, it, the default state is it goes basically to like the open mic and the open speaker, and it creates a nice little feedback loop on your iPad, which is really great. And then you're like uh, scrambling to try and get your audio back. Uh, so that, yeah. that is my that is my feedback. So be careful. This that. has just become a noise and feedback performance. Right. Exactly. Yeah. What which iPad are you are you using the new iPad for this or? Uh, so I have the I guess it would be the. 2020 iPad, so not the M1 one, but the one just before it, and it's the it's the full like 12 inch iPad Pro with the USB C and everything. Um, but but for whatever reason, it's just you know either the connection and sometimes like if you knock a USB cable, it'll just pull it out just enough so that it mm -hmm. disconnects or something like that. Or the other part is you having to deal a lot with random, you know, Chinese USB hubs and stuff like that to get multiple things connected. And sometimes those don't always play nice. So like when it works, it's really great and it's super powerful. Like AUM is such a powerful app mm -hmm. uh, and all of the various like audio unit plugins that people have made, they're, they're crazy powerful. And I really love that setup when it works, but like trying to connect it with external audio in particular and expecting some sort of reliability so like it's fun for messing around in the yeah. studio but for playing live i don't i don't know that i would trust it enough interesting i i mean I, i'd have to check to see which ipad i have i haven't had any crash issues knock on wood but i also didn't have like 20 channels of aum going either so yeah. like that could have something to do with it too like yeah. to be fair i've never had issues with the app itself crashing it's mostly with the, whatever it's connected to externally, like audio interfaces and stuff, those will get disconnected and then it goes into a bad place until everything kind of reconnects. Yeah. Out. That's good to know. If it's just a physical issue, I, I used to be a roadie. <laughs> so I'm, I'm used to paranoia of what can go wrong live. And yeah. if you've ever seen my gigging case, it has all sorts of Velcro and everything all around it to lock down every single cable so it can't jitter. So there's always Velcro a loop and then it goes into something. And I think I'd probably be the same if I took an iPad out as like duct tape and Velcro just to make sure that the connections could come out while I'm playing. Right. <laughs> Are you thinking about trying the the iPad just to try it out, Chris? Or I'm gonna get I'm gonna try it out. I've not gone into iPad apps at all. Um, but I know there's a lot of cool ones. I see a lot of particularly cool granular ones and things like that. And I have an ES8 over in the case in the monster behind me. And it was really encouraging to see that you could directly connect the uh, newer iPads into like an ES8 or ES9 without having to go through a hub because that removes one possibility of failure. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start experimenting with it and see what I can do with that. And I, you know, yesterday's sessions got me thinking like I could re replace the, um, WMD performance mixer with say an ES8 and an ES9. So I'd have plenty of IO and even some CV stuff or whatever from the iPad. And that's that's an interesting way of going. I just haven't it's something for me to do this winter <laughs> to try that out. One point there is that unlike a Mac where you can do like aggregated devices and stuff like that, the, the way the iPad works is like you only get one. Whatever the last connected audio interface, that is the audio interface. So I don't know that, oh, you know, that would be a problem. Both the yeah. ES8 and ES9, you'd have to kind of pick one. It won't show all of their I.O. There's not even like a settings menu to go select. It literally is just like whatever the last thing that was plugged in, that's that's the audio interface. Can you, that's can good you to know. ES8 That'd be a problem. as ADAT expander for the ES9 though? Because uh, the ES9 does not have ADAT. The ES9 no, only, no, it only has uh, SPD. ASCVU. Uh, yeah, OK. Well, then not. Yeah, I, mean, well, I was looking at the exact <laughs> same thing. It's like, hell, ES9 and ADAT expansion? I'm golden. But yeah. the, the 9 does not have the ADAT expanders. Yeah. 
I, I had asked us on the, the mod wiggler forum if it was even possible. And I think there's some sort of hardware limitation on the ES9 that it can't do ADAT. So. Yeah. Oh, well, ES10. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Oz is doing analog modules now, so we'll see what happens. So ES10 will be an analog mixer with an USB interface for the channels. That would be neat, kind of. Careful, this is how rumors start. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tried the oscillator and the filter, and they're great, doing by the way. I've been using the new uh, the oscillator and the filter. That's based. I was jamming on it with it all, all night last night, and they sound fantastic. The new expert sleepers. Yeah, just thought I'd throw that out there for those who are looking for any new filter or oscillator to check out. It's definitely is worth there, looking into. Is there any like anything novel to their sound quality, or is it just like it's a good solid analog filter it's and oscillator? Just a really good solid analog uh, oscillator, and it's it's beefy, uh, lots of modulation uh, inputs for it as well. It just it just sounds really good. I'm I'm I'll do like an Instagram video, or I'll do a video on it soon, and so you guys can check it out. And but that would be yeah. awesome. And the filter and is. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're pretty small too, if I remember. Yeah, like the same as size as the Disting EX. So what is that like 8 HP? I think it's 8 HP. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like in my gigging cases, like how much oscillator can I get into the minimum footprint in this case? So I have a uh, clavis twin waves actually in there, in addition to a, um, oh, my brain leaves me, a micro braids too. Nice. And in addition right. to sample playback, because I'm not afraid of sample playback. <laughs> yeah, I'm not afraid of sample playback either. I feel like that was like a big stigma. I've heard people, you know, I think even a few years ago that were just like, you know, anti samplers. And I mean, I'm all for using the disting, the assimilator, the salample, the 1010 micro bit box, the black box, whatever it takes. Yeah. There's a question actually. Uh, you know, the funny thing is, are. do you have your hand up? Did I miss you? Yeah, yeah, I, I have. I have. Go ahead, go ahead. Because it, it just fits the, the topic. If you just say uh, twin waves and then uh, braids, um, do you do you treat treat that the same way as you do with the monster case and stack oscillators and basically use the twin wave as a analog oscillator? I have or the twin wave, just... not in the monster, but just but just in the gigging case. Oh yeah, that's and, what I mean. Um, quite like, often you... I'll just use it. To... Yeah. Um, most of the time, I'll use it just to pull up different algorithms depending on what piece I'm playing back. I'll either use the, the super saw or I'll use the additive. And I'll mm -hmm. always have a modulation source going into the um, additional input, just always be changing the tone on every single note. And then what I'm doing quite often with the twin waves is that it, the second half can also be an LFO, and I'll quite often self patch some sort of like random drunken walk pattern on the LFO back into the modulation input on the VCAO one side of the twin waves, just to give a constant modulation of motion to the sound. So for one VCO voice, it sounds fatter. Mm. And that kind of ties into something uh, Trovarsi is talking about sampling. I thrilled using sample players for loops and ambiences. I've not gotten into sampling my modular and playing back samples of the modular. And partly that's because a lot of my patching philosophy is I try to get every note to sound different. Um, I'm really working a lot with chaotic modulation sources, sample and holds, things like that. So that every single note out of the sequence, sequence or every single note I play on the keyboard has a slightly different envelope and tone than the previous note. And because of that, that's kind of driven me away from multi-sampling my modular and loading that into the system. Nice. There's a quick question by uh, Nick. He asked, I don't know if you saw his comment there. He asked if you Linnaeus, have- Yes, yes. Yeah, it's a great. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, uh, confession time. Um, Linnaeus is a super cool filter. Um, you talk about sweet spots, keep the resonance down because <laughs> Dave made, made, went out of his way to make it a, a highly resonant state variable filter. 
and it will go into juicy sounds and into self oscillation really fast. So one of the tricks of making Linnaeus more tameable is keeping the resonance down to half or a third of what you might be used to as your starting point. But the funny thing is like Linnaeus is a cool stereo filter. It can also act as an FM oscillation pair. It can also act as a drum a module. And lately I've been using it for EQ. <laughs> uh, it has all these things it can do, but quite often instead I'll take stereo sources run through Linnaeus, dial in a filter profile, like maybe a low shelf with just a little bit of a high pass because all the filter modes cross fade into each other. And then I'll use that to process stereo loops or stereo ambiences, again, with some sort of slow chaotic modulation, just to keep those things constantly moving over time. Um, the most recent piece I put up on YouTube, Shipwrecked, had slowed down surf sounds, but then they went through Linnaeus with just a little bit of resonance, just a little bit of peaking on a little bit of a high pass filter effect and a chaotic source, just so rather than being a constant tone ambient, it would occasionally be up in a higher register, it would occasionally be in a lower register, et cetera. And I've been using Linnaeus far more as a stereo EQ than as a filter lately, and I feel guilty for that, but there, there it is. He said he'll give it a try for sure. He's going to try that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I wanna... follow a lot of stuff up with an additional filter stage just to add additional tonal change to it. Nice. I just want to check in really quick uh, with everyone and just I think we're kind of starting to wind things down a bit. We're about quarter past the hour. And does, does anybody have any additional questions for Chris before we go into wrapping things up? This has been a great session. Uh, I, I like asking you these, having these opportunities to ask you these. No, I, I appreciate the questions. questions it's fun, I love talking about this stuff. Yeah, because you know I'm obviously a nerd about this stuff, and I and I think a lot about what I do, um, and so yeah, I enjoy talking through what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Yeah, and I appreciate all of our other conversations, and I I know we we go back and forth a lot talking about each other's sets and stuff. So I, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your mixing strategy, uh, just like, especially when you're combining modular and all of the other kind of like desktop and other synths and stuff, are you mixing purely digitally in Ableton? Are you doing any sort of hardware mixing before it goes to Ableton? I'm trying to mix in Ableton as much as possible. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm, Ableton is also my multi-track recorder. So, and I'm trying to break out as many of my sources as possible to individual tracks inside Ableton to give me the ability later on to go back and fix a mix, um, fix a performance flaw, repeat a section to extend it. So I'm breaking down things as much as I can. And I'm flowing, it's common for me to flow 20, 22 channels into Ableton at once while performing one of my pieces. And I've recently bought more audio interfaces I'm going to rewire my audio interfaces in here that allow me to do like 48 channels at once if I want to, because uh, I like stems. But now that I have them as stems anyway, they're each on their own channel inside Ableton. So I will then go ahead and mix them inside Ableton as well using soft interfaces. The um, <laughs> I'm pointing to something that's not over there anymore. The uh, Novation keyboard can only do eight channels unless I page. So I actually has the Novation keyboard and a Novation. Um, launch control side by side. So I've got 16 faders across. Some of those are stereo channels. A lot of them are stereo channels. So I can just live mix all of the channels that are inside Ableton Live at one time. And then after things have been multi track recorded, a really important thing is for me to come back afterwards with a parametric EQ and EQ things out of each other's frequency ranges. It's, you know, it's possible to create all these beautiful full bandwidth sounds. But when it comes time to play several parts at once, they'll start stomping on top of each other and getting things muddy. So a big part of the strategy in Ableton as well is using something like a fab filter um, parametric EQ to roll off the low end, roll off the high end, do some notching or whatever is necessary to get things out of the way of each other so you can hear each part clearly. Nice. Uh, let me ask you this. So you mentioned submixing earlier. So are you submixing some of your oscillators before they even track into Ableton? Or is this now that you've had this 
larger mixer you're literally going through and I'm and I'm sub mixing choice. oscillators before they hit the filter is what I'm mainly doing. They are okay. Um, if I can, if I have enough channels, I'll break out everything into into Ableton. But like in the most recent piece, I was running out of channels, and I had two different bell sounds that were running at the same time that I was bringing in and out. So I brought both of those into a verbose um, scan and pan at the same time. Um, and then I was live mixing the submix of two different bell sounds through that one mixer. And I was printed, excuse me, one serial track inside Ableton. Nice. And so this um, now you're not at this point, then you're not even using your performance mixer because that's for your travel case. This is strictly. Yeah, the performance the mixer is my travel case. Yeah. Yeah. This is on site here. And so for the monster for studio stuff, I'm mixing inside um, Ableton for the travel case. And MKB had a question about percussion and playing yes. live. We'll, we'll segue into that. Is I'm using the performance mixer so I can go ahead and fade everyone at once. That's why I have the expander and have as many tracks so I can split all my sources out rather than submixing before they hit the performance mixer. And I have the DB25 breakout for the performance mixer so I can record all those individual stems out of it as well. Nice. So I'm, I try to do very little submixing inside the live case as well. Before in you answer, able, oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, go for it. I was just gonna say, before you answer MKV's question, I wanna read it out loud for loud. So okay, sure, yeah, just yeah. listening, they know. So he asked, can you talk about playing modular percussion with live musicians? What technique do you use to be nimble and responsive? Yeah, there's a couple techniques that I use. One is having a pre-fader cue bus on the mixer, which the performance mixer has, is mm -hmm. essential to me because I will try out ideas that I'm, I'm hearing just in my headphones before I bring it up into the mix for everybody else. And yes. particularly when I'm jamming with other people and I'm not sure, say what sample loop layer is going to work well with what they're doing. I'll go through an audition, several different sample loops until I find one that sounds good, then I'll bring it up in the main mix. Mm -hmm. And I should take a step back from that. The way that um, my black box and bit box are organized for live performance is I've made a bunch of presets per tempo. So I have every five BPM, I have another one or two or three presets with a collection of loops that are all at that tempo. So when I'm playing with someone else, either I'm sending them the clock or I'm getting the clock from them into Pamela. I'm looking at Pamela's new workout to see what the BPM is that they're playing at. Then it gives me an idea of what loops I can go for in my sample collection. I'll put the sampler up on the pre-fader queue try out the different loops, see which one sounds good, then I'll bring that up into the mix. That's one strategy. Another strategy is I make sure the modules make it really easy for me to thin stuff out or to make stuff more complex. Mm. And for grids, it's very easy to use those fill sliders to go ahead and fill, increase density, decrease density, or take a part out altogether. Euclidean circles, how many beats are inside one circle or take them out. But I also follow things up with a probability skipper as well. Mm -hmm. So quite often I'll have things going through a probability skipper like my hi-hat patterns and I'll either crank up, you know, nothing gets dropped, 16th note hi-hats or start creating holes in it to maybe just the occasional sound gets through by reducing the probability of a gate getting through from something onto the sound module. So it's a combination of pre-fader cue bus to audition stuff before I bring it up and having modules that allow me to quickly thin out or add density to the individual patterns that allows me to respond quickly to people. The, the module that you're referring to is the Latix one, right? The I have the Latic probability skipper inside the gigging case, and I have immutable instruments branches in the monster. Okay. And that's for trigger when you're either sequencing modular percussion or one shots out of the big box. That that's when you're using the grids and, and that the that technique. Yeah, and for what it's worth, I'm not using one. I'm not well, let me, that's not true. Uh, the bitbox I'm doing just loops, and the reason I'm doing that is because the bitbox can sync to an external clock and do Ableton Live resync. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing all the loops for that. One shot percussion I've got loaded into a disting in the in the gigging case because mm -hmm. it can give me two channels of one shot inside four HP, which is fabulous. So again, another way I respond quickly is I have a bunch of one shots of my favorite kicks, my favorite snares, my favorite pneumatic sounds, all loaded into uh, the disting. 
I can bring up a prefader queue and go, which kick sounds good with this? That one, now I can bring it up in the mix. Nice. This is all valuable information. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, you know, it's like it's you, you learn every time you play, you learn something. And yeah. every time I play, I respond to like what worked, what didn't work. Let's change the technique or change a module out so it goes better next time. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for taking the time out. This has been a great uh, Patreon matchup. We ha we should do this again. We should do it quarterly. Or yeah, something. I'd love to do it again for <laughs> Modulation Sound Lab. I, and I am going to keep doing it on a monthly basis for the learning modular uh, patrons, at least through the end of the year until I, my leg gets healed, because <laughs> I'm kind of like <laughs> limited what I can do right now. And I want to do more stuff for my, my patrons. So like next month, Todd Barton's going to be the host. So that's oh, going to nice. be a very interesting conversation about, and he and I have already started the conversation all flying ahead of time talking about composition strategies and stuff like that. So that's gonna be a fun talk because he has a very much more abstract avant-garde approach where I'm very groove oriented. And we're gonna see where do our worlds overlap and talk about that next month. Nice, I'm looking and forward in to two that. Months, uh, <laughs> yeah, Kim Bjorn, who I co-wrote Patch Tweak with is going to be my co-host in a couple months. So that's gonna be fun as well. Nice, nice. Uh, well, I just want to check in with everyone. Uh, thank you to the listeners out there on Blast Radio. Thank you all for joining our Zoom session here on Patreon. And I just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody's questions here. Chris, do you see anything else happening in the chat? I think we got everyone. I tried to make sure. Yes. Um, let me scroll back through and make sure we didn't miss anything. Probably the only one I didn't really talk to is custom coding stuff in Max. We were talking about things failing live. I was on another Zoom call Wednesday where people talked about Max's ability to fail is directly proportional to how soon it is to the start of the gig. <laughs> <laughs> if you do a sound check six hours ahead of time, perfect. If it's 15 minutes before you go on, things are just freezing on you. So <laughs> that has me scared of using Max live. <laughs> All right. Well, then in that case, let's wrap it up. I'm going to stop uh, streaming to Blast Radio for just a moment. So thank you all out there for listening uh, and tuning in. Appreciate it. Uh, and we'll be I'll be back soon. Thank you. OK, I stopped the stream for Blast and I want to say thank you uh, to our patrons. Seriously, thank you guys for being here. Appreciate it. Hopefully you <laughs> Brian, I see you have like another member, our Patreon member there. That's hey. super excited to be here. <laughs> Can you say cool. hi? Say hi. 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 <laughs> yeah, he'll, he'll soon be a paying member. He just needs. He'll soon be a paying member. He he's gonna get him started early on the modular. Good, yeah. good, good choice. Yeah. Yeah. Modulation Sound Lab needs needs a family plan. <laughs> oh yeah you can bribe me with french fries i'll take a french fry um, they, 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 they are fish fries but they actually like power boogie <laughs> he's so cute it has like a head it has like a body that has a bottom cool i know right i'm like now i want french fries <laughs> all right um <laughs> All right, I'm gonna at this in this note I'm gonna just stop stop the recording now for the session. <laughs>